Uh, take your Bibles, please. Turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 35. Exodus 35, I'm very much aware of the time. When you find your place, stand with me, please. I'm aware of the time, uh, but I feel like God has this for us tonight. And so I'll be as brief as I can, all right? Amen. David Allen, is that you back there? I thought that was you on the back row. Amen. It's been a while. Been a few years. Good to see you here tonight, buddy. Exodus chapter 35, we're going to start here. We're going to bounce around to a couple of the places. I've got four points uh, that the Lord laid on my heart this afternoon that I think would just really go hand in hand with what Brother Cranston just uh, shared with our church and challenged our church. You'll see that, I believe, here in just a moment. So for the sake of time, Exodus 35, um, Moses is, is, is uh, explaining to the nation of Israel that God is wanting to build a tabernacle here and he's wanting to take up an offering, okay, like we just did. And, and, and um, we, st we start in verse number, <clears throat> well, these are good verses. Verse number five, take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. An offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and Rams skins dyed red and badgers skins and shittim wood and oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. And every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. Skip down with me if you would to verse number 20. And all the congregation of the Lord of Israel, children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Verse 21. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred him up and everyone whom his spirit made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for the holy garments. I want to preach for a little bit tonight on this word stirred, stirred. We're going to look at it in three or four places in the scriptures tonight. Ask God to do just that in our hearts tonight. Father, we thank you for the privilege to stand, preach the word of God. Lord, as we just take a word and just kind of highlight it in the message tonight. From both the Old Testament and the New Testament, I pray that we would understand the importance for the child of God, Lord, to be able to make sure that they stay in a spiritual state to where they can be stirred about things that really matter. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. Now, one of the things I found out about um, Christians is they're quick to make excuses for why they're not stirred. I just preached five times in the state of Maine. And it's almost as if the people in Maine pride themselves in being stoic to the point of being almost without a pulse. And I was trying to figure out how to address that without coming across as a, a rude or obnoxious or disrespectful of another culture or group of people and the way they do things because I can do that. I have the tendency to do that, offend people. I make people mad when I hug their neck and say, I love you. They want to slap me for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to address that, that culture of sitting in church like Kalaj of the wooden Indian standing by the door. And I was trying to figure out how to word it. And brother Massingale got up to preach and took the words right out of my mouth. And he pointed out a very interesting thing, and that was that the uh, football fans in New York celebrate a touchdown same way they do in Texas. And the baseball fans on, in California celebrate a home run the same way they do in New York, by jumping out of their seat and going out of their mind crazy. And he brought out that it's not a cultural problem, it is a spiritual problem. Amen. Amen. We were literally an hour from the Patriot Stadium and those people will sit up there in the snow and watch football. And they will jump up and down and they will holler for their team and then go to church on Sunday and say, well, we just don't get excited. We're reserved, we're quiet, we're, we're diplomatic. I know down south y'all get emotional, but up here we don't get emotional. And that's just a bunch of hooey's what that is. 
Here's the problem. We've got people today that is near about impossible to get them stirred about spiritual things. And tonight I want to give you four places in the scripture and four elements and four areas where the child of God ought to be stirred. One of the greatest capabilities, listen to me, in the life of a child of God is the ability to be stirred. It is a sad day. If the day ever comes in the life of a Christian when they cannot be stirred by spiritual things. Now we're going to look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. So obviously the word stir is going to be in two different languages. In the Old Testament, it's going to be in the Hebrew. In the New Testament, it's going to be in the Greek. But as I looked these verses up and I looked the words up, I was fascinated to discover that they kind of work together. Are you ready for this? In the Hebrew, the word stirred in our text, which is mentioned here in this chapter twice, in the next chapter once, and we're going to look at it in just a second. The word stirred means to lift, to lift, to bear up, to carry, or to take. That's what the word stir means in the Hebrew, okay? Just put a pin in that. Hold on to that. In the Greek, in the New Testament, when we look at it in just a moment, it means to kindle up, to inflame one's mind or strength or zeal. It goes on to mean, that word stir means to wake up, to awaken or to arouse from sleep. And so if you look at the two different meanings of the word stir, what it basically means, if you want to put the Greek and the Hebrew together, it means to be aroused from sleep and stirred up to the point to where you're able to carry and bury uh, or bear the burden. In other words, it's not just an emotional thing. It is an emotion that brings about an action. It means a stirring to where you are awakened and kindled and aroused to get up under a burden and to carry it and to lift it and to bear it. And that is exactly what we're going to look at tonight. We're not talking about hype. We're not talking about charisma. We're not talking about emotional outburst. We're talking about something deep inside that motivates you to actually do something with what you've heard. There are four areas I want to look at tonight that I believe the child of God should be stirred. Number one, in our text, we should be stirred about the place of worship. The place of worship. Now they are, obviously, they've been taken out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness, okay? And they're on their way to Canaan land. They're on their way to cross the Jordan River. It's going to take them a while to get there, but that's what's happening. God says, I want you to build a sanctuary. I want you to build a tabernacle that I may dwell with you. That's what he said. God had a very specific criteria of the way he wanted that tabernacle to be made. The furniture, the, 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 the curtains, everything, very detailed. And it's, but it started out, the first thing they had to do was they had to take up an offering. They had to take up a collection, all right? And so that's what chapter 35 is about. And the Bible tells us that Moses stood up and said in verse number five, take you from among you an offering unto the Lord. Uh, Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. And he gives a whole long list of items that they needed in order to build this tabernacle out in the middle of this wilderness. The Bible says in verse 20, the congregation heard it and they departed. They all went back to the house. And then in verse number 21, and they came. All right. So they heard the plea. They heard the appeal. We need to build a tabernacle. We need to build a sanctuary here in the wilderness for God, the God of heaven, to come and meet with us, for God to come down and dwell with us where we can commune with him and we can hear what he wants us to know and do what he wants us to do. Now we got to take up an offering. We need to build this thing. This is all the stuff we need. This is the grocery list we need, all right? And it's pretty crazy, all the stuff they needed. Badger skins dyed red and, and tapestry and, and gold and silver. I mean, they're out in the middle of nowhere. And they were, they've been slaves for 400 years. But if you'll remember, right when they left Egypt, they spoiled all the people. They borrowed all this stuff from their neighbors. They're like, can I borrow all the stuff out of your jewelry box? Can I have all your gold and silver? I promise I'll give it back. And they left. All right. 
And so Moses says, take up an offering. Look at what it says in verse 21. And they came. Everyone whose heart stirred him up. Stirred him up. Their heart was stirred. Their heart was moved. Their heart was awakened out of slumber in order to get up under the burden of building this tabernacle to the point that they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all of his service and for the holy garments. And it gives a list of all the stuff that they brought. Look at what it says in verse number 26. And all the women whose heart stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair and the rulers brought onyx stones and it just goes on and goes on. Verse 29, the children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made him willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. You've got to understand the nation of Israel is in the middle of nowhere. They have just left Egypt. They've been freed, but I mean they're not in ideal circumstances. They're living in tents. They're just sitting there waiting for God to move the pillar and the fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. And uh, they, they, they were just people like we're people. And I mean, they got kids and they got, they got chickens and they got goats and they got, they got their stuff and, and they're arguing with one another and they're grumbling and complaining about not having enough food and not have enough water, just typical Baptist. And I thought they were Baptist until I got this chapter and realized they can't be Baptist because they brought so much stuff in. The man of God had to stop the offering. He said, don't bring no more. So I don't know what they were. But anyway, and I'm thinking, the man of God says, we're going to build a tabernacle. We're going to build a sanctuary out here so we can meet with God. And that stirred the hearts of the people. We're stirred about a place of worship. Look at chapter 36. Bible says, well, we got to back up to verse 30. I like this guy. This guy right here is a jack of all trades. And Moses said unto the children of Israel, see the Lord hath called by name Bezalel. Bezalel. Remember that name. Verse 31, he hath filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and all manner of workmanship to devise curious works, to work in gold and silver and brass, and in the cutting of stones, to set them, and in carving of wood, to make any manner of cunning work. This guy was a, he was a silversmith, he was a goldsmith, he was a brass smith, he was a jeweler, and he was a carpenter. This guy could do it all. I like this guy. This is impressive to me. Every church needs a half a dozen basil eels, amen. <laughs> Bible says he put in his heart that he may teach both he and a holy of the son of uh, whatever his name was, to the tribe of Dan. Them hath he filled with the wisdom of heart to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workman and of the embroiderer in purple and blue and scarlet and fine linen and of the weaver, even of them that do any work of those that devise cunning work. This guy had every skill set that you can imagine. And look what happens. The Bible says in verse number one, then brought Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise hearted man in whom the Lord had put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every wise-hearted man in, whom, in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even everyone whose heart stirred him up to come unto the work to do it. Are y'all seeing this? The women, the men, everybody, their heart was stirred about a place to worship, about a place for God to meet with them about a place for them to have set aside where God could come down and say, this is what I want you to do. And they could hear the words from God and the man of God could go in there and sprinkle that blood on that mercy seat and make atonement. I mean, they were excited about the prospect of a place to worship, meet with God. You know what we need today? We need every church member for their heart to get stirred about the place of worship. And not just about what's going to happen when we get there, but all the stuff that goes into it before we ever get there. Amen. The worshiping, the giving, the work, all of it. We need a group of people that is stirred. Their hearts are stirred about a place of worship. Is everybody still with me? Turn with me, if you would, over to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. We're just going to hit the highlights tonight. This could be a four-part series easily. Easily, it could be a four-part series. 
But we're going to blow through here tonight real quick. Second Timothy chapter number one. The apostle Paul is writing to young Timothy. Here's what he says. In verse number three, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded and that is in thee also. Verse number six, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Number two, write this down. We need to be stirred about partaking in the work of God. Paul said, stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which hath given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which he has heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us, I'm talking about being involved in the ministry, being a partaker of the ministry, being a partaker of that holy calling, being a partaker of the afflictions. I love what the preacher just said. Are we really so narcissistic as to think that we as Americans ought to avoid any of the persecution and the tribulation and the sufferings that Christians all over this globe are having to deal with tonight? I mean, many churches underground, they have to fly under the radar. They have to meet in secret. They can't pass out tracts like we do. They can't have an internet ministry like we do. They can't put a sign out by the road like we do. And yet the apostle Paul told Timothy, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I want you to stir up that gift that is in you. And I want you with your head held high to embrace the afflictions and the ministry that God's put you into. Don't be ashamed. Don't hold your head down. Don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of what God's called you to do. God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. And he called you and do it. Hold fast. Sometimes we have to stir ourselves up. It's what he said in verse six, stir up the gift of God, which is in thee. Man, I tell you, it's easy to get complacent. It's easy to lose your zeal and your passion and your fire. My wife always keeps a, at least a quart of buttermilk in the refrigerator. I know I just lost half of y'all, but I'm praying you'll get saved before it's over with. She'll make cornbread. She'll make a big old pan of cornbread. And I'll go in there and cut me out about two big old wedges about that big and crumble it up in a cereal bowl. And I'll pour buttermilk over the top of it. It's gonna be at the marriage supper of the lamb. You can go ahead and write that down. But here's what I found out about that buttermilk. You've got to shake it up real good. Because the top of it will be like water. And the bottom of it will be all clumpy. Just coagulated milk down in the bottom of that jug. Come on, y'all. This is good Bible preaching right here. Make sure that lid's tight. Shake it up real good. Shake it up real good. Because all the good stuff's at the bottom. And I pour it out over that cornbread, and when I do it, it just goes, plop, 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 plop. it just plops out. Son, you have to stir it up. Stay with me, Brother Adriel. Stay with me. 
Orange juice, all that pulp settles to the bottom. Can I preach about orange juice for a second? Can I bring, can I bring y'all back into the fold with some orange juice? Amen. I like that orange juice has got that pulp in it. Amen. I like that orange juice has got the pulp in it. It tastes like they just squeezed that orange right into your glass. But you got to shake it up. You got to shake it up. All the good stuff settles to the bottom and all the thin stuff's on the top. You know what'll happen to a Christian that don't let God stir them up? You won't know what'll happen to a church where God never moves in and shakes the place like he did in the book of Acts. Huh? It ain't fit. That's the point I'm trying to make. We need to ask God to stir us when it comes to getting involved in the work of God. And we're living in the last days and we got people today uh, that they won't, they won't boldly testify because they're afraid they're going to get attacked. They're afraid somebody's going to say something. They won't even post something spiritual on their Facebook page. You go look at their Facebook feed and it is full of pictures of their food and their stupid cat. <laughs> Nothing about God. No Bible verses, nothing they got out of their devotion, not sharing the services, not sharing the highlights of what God's doing in their life. They're afraid that somebody's going to unfriend them, unfollow them. I'm afraid my friends are going to unfriend me or unfollow me. So be it. Who cares? I block people all the time. I block them. I just block them. I delete their comments, I hit block, and I'm smiling. <laughs> I'm smiling when I do it. I'm like, that just, I just felt like I was taking out the trash just for a second. It's just, I don't care. You ought not to care. Stirred about being involved, that God would let us, that God would let us be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. The early church rejoiced. They were found worthy to suffer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Number three. Turn with me over to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number one. 2 Peter, or toward the end of your New Testament. If you'll listen fast, I'll preach fast. 2 Peter chapter number one. Write this down, number three. We ought to be stirred the child of God, the church of the living God ought to be stirred about the promises of the word of God. It ought to stir us. In chapter one of 2 Peter, Peter said in verse three, according as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Verse four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. How much more could you magnify the promises of God. He said they're exceeding and they're great and they're precious promises Amen. that are given to us Amen. that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, man, how can you just say, and beside this, you're just talking about exceeding great and precious promises and now we're just gonna push that off to the side and beside this, Given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it me as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. What is he saying? He's saying these promises of God, if you will heed them and you will 
let God put these things in your life, you will not be barren and you will not be unfruitful and you will not fall and you will not stumble, but you will be a successful, prosperous Christian. And he said, I'm gonna spend every waking hour doing everything I can to stir you up by bringing these things to remembrance. He said, in fact, I wanna do such a good job of it that after I'm dead and gone, you still remember what I said. Stirred up about the promises of the word of God. Exceeding great, exceeding great and precious promises. How could we ever forget them in the first place is what I want to know. Twice, three times, he said, always in remembrance, verse number 12. Verse number 13, by putting you in remembrance. Verse number 15, to have these things always in remembrance. I thought to myself, how bad off have we got to be spiritually to forget the exceeding great and precious promises of God. Well, I wish we had the same memory that our kids have when we promised to do something for them. If you be good this week, we'll take you to McDonald's and get an ice cream cone. They don't forget that. They will remind you several times a day. Huh? You said we was going to go that. You said we was going to go to McDonald's and get an ice cream cone. And we're going to, son. I'm just tired today. I'm tired. We'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow, as soon as you walk in the door, we're going to McDonald's and get an ice cream cone. And you look at them and you think, how, how can you, you got a rip string on your finger? How do you remember that? They remember those promises. You know what we got to do to make sure we don't forget the promises of God. Every now and then we got to have a preacher stand up and say, remember? <laughs> Stir you up. Remember? Huh? Remember? Remember he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You can walk in here with your chin dragging your tracks out, acting like God's dead. Hey, let me remind you, God's never failed. God's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. He's promised to always be there. He's promised to answer your prayers, to stir you up, stir you up, remind you about the promises of God. We forget them sometimes. Grace and the kids was laughing. In the living room, I think it was them. Yeah, Spencer, Spencer, doing his daddy imitation. <laughs> I was, didn't even know he was paying attention, but he was. What was that you said? If you, if you give, if you give, and you go broke, and you can't pay your bills, and you die, we'll write a book about you, and you'll be famous, because you'll be the first person in history that ever obeyed God with their giving and starved to death. Yeah, they was, he was mimicking me at the house. <laughs> Heard me say that so many times. But that's the truth. We got church members that act like if they start tithing, that they're gonna starve to death, and God's gonna make them live in a cardboard box underneath the bridge. I'm telling you if, you, if you obey God in your giving and you starve to death, I can promise you, I will write a book about you. You'll be famous and I will be rich because you will be the first person in the history of the world that starved to death, obeying God and trusting God. Amen. That's never happened. And yet we got Christians every week of their life questioning whether or not I'm going to Fill out my faith promise. I know I promised to give this to missions, but I had a flat tire this morning. And that's just life. I got back from the airport, went to throw my suitcases with all the books that I didn't sell, and I sold over $600 worth of books out of the bookstore while I was up there. But I still had something left in my suitcase, and I went to throw my, my, my bags up in the back seat of my truck so I could go in and quickly get ready for church and my truck wouldn't unlock. My battery was dead. My wife's like, what did you do, leave a light on? I don't know. I don't know, I ain't got time to fool with it. That's life. I'll, tomorrow after chapel, I'll go home and jump it off, I reckon. I'm gonna have to buy another battery. They're like 150 bucks. They're building back better. They're, they're better than ever before. <laughs> Battery used to be $75, now they're $150. 
There was not one part of me that thought to myself, man, if I've got to go to AutoZone and buy a battery for my truck, I ain't gonna be able to tithe this week. Are you out of your mind? You'd have fell out of your bed and bumped your head if you think my bills in any way, shape, or form ever determines my tithes and my missions. Mm -mm. No. It might get into my grocery money. It might get into my play money. But it ain't going to get into my God money. And this ain't a message about giving, even though these two points kind of touch on them a little bit. It's a message about being stirred by the promises of God. But number three, let me give you this one. Oh, I, look, are you still in Second, second Peter? Look at chapter three. He said it again. In, cha in chapter three, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets. We're talking about the promises of God being stirred to remember what God said. Well, let me give you one last point, all right? Turn with me back to Acts chapter 17. And boy, this really is gonna tie in with what Brother Cranston shared with us. Acts chapter number 17. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul is been, 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 uh, he's, he's, in, he's in Athens. That's Athens, Greece, not Athens, Georgia. He's not out of Georgia Bulldogs football game. <clears throat> I don't know why I had to bring that up. Verse 16, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. You see that? What was it stirred? What was it stirred about? The sights? All the little tourist attractions, all the little booths that had all the little knickknacks, all the little curios and little handmade stuff that had Athens on there, little magnets for your refrigerator and little handbags that said Athens on there. My grandpa went to Athens and all he bought me was his stupid T-shirt. No, no, that's not what he was stirred about. He was stirred about, he was stirred over the plight of the lost and unsaved world that he was witnessing on top of this mountain. The Bible says his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Stirred about the plight of the world. Seeing the need seeing the spiritual depravity, seeing the spiritual darkness. He's standing around looking at all of this idolatry and these idols and these images. And I mean, they were just lying in the streets and they had all these false gods that they were praying to and worshiping. And just to make sure they had all their bases covered, they had one carved out that they was worshiping and it was a unknown God, just in case we miss one. Huh? Y'all seeing this? The Bible says, therefore he disputed he in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met him. Verse number 18, the Bible says he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. You know what stirred Paul's heart? in Athens on Mars Hill. The plight of the lost and unsaved. We would say this down south, he was tore out of the frame. Tore out of the frame. He looked around and saw all these idols and something inside of him just started churning. He was stirred in his spirit. Now stay with me. Full circle, back to the definitions. Full circle. He wasn't just stirred and said, oh, bless their heart. Oh, my goodness, I wish, I wish somebody would tell them about Jesus. Something inside of him was awakened. That something inside of him was, was stirred, but it stirred him to do something about it. And that's what the story is about. He said to them in verse number 22, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Him declare I unto you. 
He wasn't just stirred. He was stirred to get up under the burden, to get up under the need, to get involved in the work. All of these places that we looked at this evening about being stirred. Well, I, just, I could just preach for another hour. I noticed this. I'll give you this and I'm done. The children of Israel's heart stirred them up. What it said, their heart stirred them up. Timothy was admonished by Paul to stir up his own self. And then Peter wrote to the saints in order to stir them up. So I had to come to the conclusion, Brother Leto, that we can both stir up ourselves and God can use us to stir up other people. Now here's the ideal Christian life. One that is constantly in a perpetual state of being stirred and being moved, but a person that takes it to the next level and says, not only am I going to be stirred, not only am I going to be challenged, not only am I going to get involved, but I want to spend every waking hour all the way to my dying day stirring up everybody around me. Let's be stirred together. Let's reach our families together. Let's reach the world together. Let's not take the things of God for granted together. I wondered this evening with heads bowed and eyes closed, when was the last time you could honestly say you were stirred beyond an emotional stirring, but a stirring and a motivation to action? And when was the last time you allowed God to use you to stir up somebody else? While the pianist is playing, altars are open, altars are full, there's room for more. Stirred, stirred, stirred to action. Stirred to the state to where you've got to do something about it. There may be somebody here tonight while the altars are full of people praying. There might be somebody here tonight that would say, Pastor Shiflet, I'm not sure if I died right now that I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure if I've ever accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm not sure that I've been forgiven of all my sins. I'm not sure that I have the gift of eternal life and I would like for you to pray for me. Would you just quietly where you're sitting, would you just quietly slip your hand up where I can see it? Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure that I've ever been saved. Pray for me. Anybody, anywhere, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. Pray for me. Anybody, anywhere? While these are praying, here's my second question. Pastor Shifflett, I needed that message tonight. Pray for me. I need God to stir me. Would you slip your hand up? Would you slip your hand up? I need God to stir me. Hands are going up. Hands are going up. Hands are going up. God bless you. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be stirred enough to be stirred out of your seat and join these in the altar and just get in the altar and say, Lord, stir my heart. Don't let my heart get settled. Maybe you've gotten cold and complacent. Maybe you've gotten indifferent. Maybe you've gotten lazy in your Bible reading and your prayer. Maybe you've gotten negligent in your soul winning and your witnessing and your outreach. Whatever God's dealing with your heart about, would you respond tonight? 